with that, this particular 0, 1. So it depends on what does it mean to be open. What does it mean to be open? Come on, it's like within four inches or so of this question in your notes. It's an open set if the boundary is empty or if its interior is the whole set. So the question is, is the boundary of 0, 1, and I can sketch it out pretty quick. What is the boundary of this set 0, 1? The boundary is just the number 1. So it has a boundary on the right side. There's no boundary on the left side. All right, so the boundary is not empty. So it's not open. So closed, that's the next one. Does it contain all the limit points? There's a limit point on the left and the right side. It has the limit point at the one side, but not the zero side. So the answer is no, it is also not closed. It's got one of the two limit points, and it's got one of the two what would be battery points, but the other one's missing, either way. So the answer is no, it is neither open nor closed. No. It's, it's a set <laughs> that's not open and also not closed. I just gave you a set that was both open and closed. It was vacuous. But that's... So the whole real line, is it open? What's the boundary of the real line? There is no boundary. Goes on forever. So the answer is yes, it's open. The boundary is nothing. Is it closed? So what are the limit points? They're all the numbers, and they're already inside of here. So it has all the limit points. It has all limit points, so it's also closed. So this is the other extreme. Basically the entire, uh, in this case, uh, real line. You could do the same thing with two-dimensional space, three-dimensional, four-dimensional. So next definition we're going to look at. called a level set. Of a function, so our functions of course are going from Rn into R1 or just into R. A level set is the inverse image of a value in the range. So what in the world is the inverse image? So we'll take C in the range of F. So C is just some number. And F inverse of C. So first of all, did I say this function is one to one? Nope. So f inverse is not necessarily a function. But I can still talk about what is the inverse of, uh, in this case, a number. So what's the inverse? It's all original x's in the domain such that f of x equals c. So it's everything back in the domain that would go to c.
And if we think of functions going from their domain to their range, you just pick something out of the range, and then you ask, well, where did this come from? If your function is not one-to-one, -one, the answer is it came from many places, or it could have come from many places. So all the places that it came from, this, that set is called a level set. And one of the reasons they call it a level set is you can think of if the function f is like a altitude function, takes some, some location and tells you the altitude, then f inverse of a number tells you every point that's at that altitude. So if you look at a topographic map, you can pick some altitude, maybe 100 feet, and you can see these uh, on a topographic map, they're all going to be uh, closed loops. Well, loop implies circle, but closed, a blob. So you start and you're going to get back to eventually where you started. And you know, if there's a mountain range, there can be lots of, uh, of the same altitude blobs around, for like one for each peak depending on your altitude, of course. So that's where the idea of level set comes from. So if you're not one to one, there may actually be many values in the domain that go to C. In fact, a one to one function is not very interesting to look at level sets, because the inverse image of a point's a point. So that's not terribly exciting. So generally, we're going to look at the inverse image of uh, non one to one functions. So that's a level set. And a surface I thought we defined this already. It's just all right, so maybe we'll be re redefining this. So a surface at least this definition needs to start in two-dimensional space and then go to one-dimensional space. So the surface is all points x, y, z such that z, oh it's a bad z, x, y, z such that z equals f of x, y and of course x, y is in the domain of f. Which you could write a little bit more compactly like this. X comma y comma f of x y. And you just have to be careful and write x y is in the domain of f. this function, f of x, y equals 100 minus x squared minus y squared, we're going to graph by using level sets. So the output we're going to call c. And we can do a little bit of, let's see, do a little bit of algebra. Let's make our x and y squareds positive by adding them, and we'll do equals 100 minus c. This form might wor work a little bit better. So what are some nice c values we could pick? All right, zero is good. I like zero. I know square root of 100, plus or minus 10. That works. What's another good value? 100. Oh, 100 is good too. We'll put it at the bottom of the list. All right. Now in between gets a little more tricky. Let's see. So I know square root of 4. So what C value do I need <coughs> to get 4? 96. 96. So I'll put 
96. What's the next one? We don't have to get them all. I can just cheat and look at my paper too. How about 99? Can't believe I forgot that one. 75. 51. Et cetera, et cetera. I cheated and looked at my paper right there. But it's just the square root, but 100 minus the, or I should say 100 minus the square that you're thinking of. So 100 minus uh, 9. Wait. Four. Did I, say, I did skip one, didn't I? 91 would be another one. Anyways, we don't need all of them, but we'll just go with some of them. All right, level sets. I'm going to graph these out. Let's start. We'll do C equals 0 first. What does the level set look like for C equals 0? So those are our C values. So 100 minus 0 is 100. All right, what does a graph of x squared plus y squared equals 100 look like? Yep, origin, center, radius 10. So draw your best circle. Not bad. And now you also have to, we chose a C value, so somewhere you gotta write C equals zero on this circle. So that's the label of the circle. I'll just write it down there in the lower, lower right part. Let's jump way up to C equals 51. It's the next biggest one on the ch chart. X squared plus Y squared equals 100 minus 51, which is 49. So what is a graph of X squared plus Y squared equals 49? Circle radius seven. So that was forty nine square or forty nine seven squared, so this is just circle radius seven. So we'll go seven. So that's our C equals fifty one level set. Let's go right to C equals 99 level set. How about that? What it will be the graph of the C equals 99 level set? Circle radius one. <coughs> all right, so they're all just circles. What about C equals 100 level set? So, yep, it will be a point at the origin. So we get x squared plus y squared equals 100 minus 100 equals 0. So if we're keeping it real, there's no way to get anything other than 0 and 0. And that was a C equals 100. To label that pretty small to get in that circle of radius 1. All right. So what do level sets look like? They can be curves. They can also be points. The idea of a level set, generally what it's going to do is take whatever do, uh, your dimension of your domain is, and you're going to drop down one dimension, sometimes two. But generally, you'll be dropping one dimension. <coughs> so we drew four level sets on one graph. I could have drawn, uh, I think, 10 or 11 total. And I could have made C negative and then had a, a much bigger radius as well. So there is, there is a smallest level set, which is the C equals 100. If C is greater than 100, you get, uh, that's actually not in the range anymore. And you can see the original uh, 
just right here, you know, what's the biggest value you can get out of that? Well, x squared and y squared is always positive, so it's 100. And then the biggest value I can get out of the second part is 0. After that, it's all negatives. So the biggest C I'm going to get is 100. Everything else is going to be less than 100. And I, of course, I could get a negative 1,000 for C or negative any large value I want, which means the radius of your circle will keep growing if I chose a big negative C value. So what does a full graph of this function look like? Well, if we think of C as a height, this is almost a cone, except it won't necessarily be uh, going out at a constant radius. So it's going to be sort of cone-like shaped. And you can draw, let's see, we'll do our best to draw this. Uh, I've had the three-dimensional disclaimer many times. So we'll start up here at 100. That is our uh, output or our z value. And we said there was a point there. So that's 100. I'm going to try to label 99, <laughs> which is going to be super close, because 100, I think that's probably way more than one below 100 right there. So that is supposed to be a circle. You can draw it artistically if you want. Uh, let's go to 51. Ah, that works. That's about halfway. 51. I feel pretty comfortable about marking that right there. Now, what is our radius at 51? We got radius 7. Okay, 51. So it looks like we measured that to be 1. So I'll do my best to go out 7 times that far. Uh, maybe there. Something like that. And last one, I'm going to draw c equals 0. Height 0, we're going to 10 and negative 10. So we'll say 10. Now I believe this will have a sort of tapered shape like a nose cone to a rocket. I don't think it'll have an actual cone shape. It should have a tapered shape. Uh, if you actually really cared, I believe this shape would be a parabola right here. If you either set x to 0 or y to 0, and you just looked at that function, it would be a parabola. So I just wanted to show level sets, which is sort of a top-down view, where you just take every, well, not every, but certain uh, height values or certain output values and look at where they came from. And those will form, uh, in this case, they'll form curves. So if your function goes from three dimensions to one dimension, a level set is called a level surface. We're going to describe some level surfaces of the function f of x, y, z equals square root x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Now, if you want to get fancy and not write x, y, z, if you want to go right to vector form, this particular function you can write as magnitude of the input. So 
So if you just want to write the input as just a single uh, three-dimensional coordinate, this function right here is just the magnitude. So level surfaces, we want to pick some values in the range and then look at where they came from. So what's a good uh, number to pick out of the range? Well, first of all, let's talk about the range. Range of f is a subset of r1, so it outputs real numbers. What type of numbers does the square root output? All positive numbers, including 0. So it looks like 0, close to 0, open at infinity. So we're just going to pick some c values. So let's pick c equals 0. So 0 equals magnitude of x. What does x have to equal? It's so a 0 vector. So in this case, x equals either the 0 point or the 0 vector. The next easiest c value is 1. So 1 is the magnitude of x. So what type of points have magnitude of 1? We're in three dimensions now. So they're all going to be a unit, basically points one distance away from the origin in three dimensions. So what type of shape is that? It's going to be a sphere, and it's going to be a hollow sphere, because it's all points one away from the origin in three dimensions. <coughs> so hollow sphere with radius one. So here's how to draw a sphere nicely. Draw a circle, and then on the inside of the circle, Draw a whatever shape that's not quite an ellipse. I think it's just a compressed circle. It might be an ellipse. I feel like the edges are too sharp to be an ellipse, though, on this particular. Maybe it's just my bad drawing of it. All right, hollow sphere with radius 1. What's another good C value? Pick any positive number, but what's a good positive number? That's not a positive number. <laughs> so we could go two, but if we jump all the way to four, that'll have a nice. Uh, actually, we can go right to two. Yes, 4 would work also, but C is 2 works because 2, remember we're taking the magnitude of points, so this is all points of distance 2 from the origin right here. So again, it's going to be a sphere, except this time it is radius 2. Oh, I forgot to draw the first one. It's just a single point, the origin. So it'll just be one point. All right, so in this case, our level surfaces are actually going to be spheres of whatever radius that we chose for C. Are you ready for calculus? Yes. It's mostly rhetorical, and I'm glad you are. So we do limits and continuity first, of course. 
So we'll start, before I can talk about continuity, we need to talk about limits. Notation is pretty easy to write. Hey, that's familiar. <laughs> so what is different with R functions versus the ones that we used way back in Calculus 1 class when we talked about limits the first time? Multivariable. So what is multivariable or multidimensional? So what, what letter on the board is not one-dimensional? X. X, which also means A needs to be the same dimension. So the difference is X and A are now in n-dimensional space. What is the output of our functions in chapter 14? Numbers. Numbers. So what letter on the board is definitely a number? No. So L is a number. So L is still a number. All right, definition of con no. Continuity. We've got to do definition of a limit first. Who remembers definition of a limit? I'll start it off. We got any epsilon greater than zero, comma. There exists. What does there exist? Delta greater than zero, such that. If absolute value x minus uh, a less than delta, and they don't need to be equal to zero, so you can hide that little. That zero just means x doesn't need to equal a, or the difference is not necessarily zero. If then. All right, that definition is exactly what you used way back in Calculus 1 class. So we just said what changed. So L is still a number. I didn't write it down, but so F of X is still a number. So F of X minus L, that's the same thing it was before. No change right there. What is different here? So what is x minus a? It's a multidimensional thing. It's an n-dimensional vector, or an n-dimensional point, however you want to think of it. So what are the absolute value sign? What do these do? That's magnitude. That's the only difference. So this is a magnitude right here. Of an n-dimensional vector. Good news is writing it out doesn't matter. Same exact notation, just vertical bars. What in the heck is this? X minus A, a magnitude's less than delta. The greater than zero part's not super important. The less than delta part's the really important part here. 
So what is changing in our limit? Something, well, epsilon and delta could be changing. Uh, what needs to be not changing is A. So A is some number you, or in this case, a point you picked beforehand. So A is fixed. So let's say this is A right here. So what we need to think about around A, I want to know what points have the property that X minus A is less than delta. So if this measurement's delta, How does the magnitude of x minus a compare to delta? So I made the delta disk right here, drew a delta disk around a. What is bigger, the number delta or the magnitude of x minus a? Delta is bigger. Yeah, it'd actually be equal. So we just don't have the boundary. So any point in the delta disk of A has this property. So what we've described, this describes the, let's see, describes D delta of A. So it's the delta disk centered at A. So a little peek ahead, what you'll do later is have outputs multi-dimensional or multi-dimensional. Yeah, so the other part, fx minus l, that would be a magnitude also. So we said any x in the delta uh, neighborhood or the delta disk has the property that f of x minus l is small. So what does that mean? So let's draw the some domain, domain, and when you f, it goes to the range. So we take some a right here, and there'll be a delta neighborhood assuming that we have our limit, that our limit actually exists. So this right here, what I wrote is the d delta of a. Now when I f that, what do I get when I f any point inside of there? So we'll take any x inside of this disk. When I f it, if we actually have a limit, I can go over into the range. So that's L. What happens in the range? <coughs> I can look at an epsilon neighborhood of L. And what it means is f of x, the point f of x is going to be inside that neighborhood over there in the range. So if I take an x close to a, a delta close to a, it's going to give me an f of x within epsilon of L. Except now things are higher dimensional. If you like set notation, Better not write f of a, then I'm assuming continuity. So if you take your delta, delta neighborhood and f it, that needs to be inside of your epsilon neighborhood of L.
All right. No problem. Uh, now, I don't want to apply that spheres or circles always go to spheres or circles. So your, you know, if this limit exists, maybe the actual image, let's go with some blue. So if, if this is a blue disk, maybe it comes over here and forms some weird shape over here. But that shape is going to be still inside of the epsilon uh, disk right there. Oh, what happens if it's too big? Well, then you just adjust your delta down smaller so that it will shrink. And you can do that if, as long as your function has a limit. Then you can shrink the delta down and make sure it lands inside the epsilon on the other on the range. My pre-calculus students were looking at the notes and saying, oh, there's no numbers, but there's numbers almost every class except the last class, I think, had almost no numbers. I think the one example had, had 1 over x written in it, and that was the only example that made it, or only number that made it through the notes. The numbers are definitely overrated. All right. So to show a limit exists, we're going to begin with some epsilon greater than 0, and then go back and find the delta. Usually your epsilon will be dependent on delta, or dependent on epsilon. So your delta is usually dependent on epsilon. That satisfies the definition of a limit. We'll do limit rules next. Our function f will go from Rn to R1. G will be similar. Goes from Rn into R. And we're going to assume the limit x approaches a, f of x equals l, and the limb x approaches a, g of x equals m. So l and m are numbers, and just like before, x and a are multivariable, either points or vectors, however you want to think of them. A very good default n value to keep in your head is 2, because you can think about blobs on a paper as domains. And then if you want to think of that graph of the function, you can think of a height. And k is a constant. So lim x approaches a of k. So what's the limit of a constant? Zero. That's derivative. You're one section ahead, maybe two sections ahead. All right, so the limit of a constant is constant. Doesn't care, x, who cares? There's no x. So it doesn't matter what x is approaching, it's going to be k. All right, next up, lim x approaches a. So we're going to go with k times f of x. So what? rule can I do when I have a number times a function I want the limit? 
So I can basically factor out the constant or just ignore the constant and just get the limit. And then it's constant times that limit value. So this is going to be KL. All right, limit of F plus G. So we know that the separately limits exist. They're L and M. What do you think the limit of F plus G will be? It will be, yes, M plus L or L plus M. Doesn't matter the order. So this is the, the sum rule. Of course, it works with differences, plus or minus. It'll work if you subtract. You have the product law. which is L times M. You get the quotient law. And of course, you need to be careful. What do you need to be careful about with quotients? Yeah, so if M is 0, you may have to use some L'Hopital's rule or some clever algebra or some other tricks like that. Uh, that would be if L and M are both zero. Now, if M is zero and L is not zero, you're most likely looking at infinity or negative infinity at that point. So you just have to, we've done a whole lot of limits of uh, zero in the denominator. So it just depends on what's happening in the numerator as to what this limit's going to be. But this rule will work when M is not zero. You can just say if it was two and three, it would be just be two thirds. So if it's not zero, you can just take the uh, fraction of the two limits. So if you have a function raised to a k power, the, it's just the limit of f, which we said was l, that number raised to the k power. And that we just want to say uh, whenever lk is defined, or I should say is real. So what's not real? Something easy like negative 1 to the half power. That's the easiest not real uh, base and power pair I can think of. So negatives to certain fractional powers are not going to be real. So I can tell you're really excited about finding some limits. So let's do some easy ones first. So we'll have xy approaching negative 3, 4. You can use the limit laws that I just wrote down to help you with this. So first of all, is the square root function continuous as long as you're not at 0? Square root function is continuous, so I can push the limit through the square root function. So I can write it. Actually, before we do any of that, let's change our notation. I haven't in multivariable, but the square root function in this case is not the multivariable part. Uh, the x squared plus y squared is that is a multivariable part. So I'm going to rewrite this as half power of lim so I approach is minus 3 4 so there's no divided by 0 no weird negative square roots so you can just go ahead and plug in negative 3 and 4 And you should get, that should be a 3, 4, 5, Pythagorean triple.
All right, get this limit right now. We're going to start getting lazy and not using commas as you are subscripting with x's and y's and commas. I'll know what you mean. What's that? As long as you know it's not, you know, if you have the number 30, make sure it's not a 3 and a 0 and it's actually a 30. Things are a little more tricky when there's multi-digit numbers involved. Ah, so there's, yeah, so that's another thing. This is a zero and another zero. It wouldn't make sense to have infinity. I'd have to have two, an infinity for the x and infinity for the y. Oh, zero over zero. All right, we don't know L'Hopital's rule yet for multivariables, though. What do we know, though? What, do you do, what did you do before you knew L'Hopital's? Use your algebra skills. All right, use your algebra skills. Oh, man. Wouldn't it be nice if I could factor out square root x minus square root y? I can certainly factor an x out. That doesn't take much creativity right there. So we have difference of squares. They're sort of hidden, though. They're square root squares. So pretend you knew that and factor it. I did all my algebra down below and all my calculus on the top row. So that second, everything below that line is all algebra. All right, what did I cancel out? Square root x minus square root y. I canceled the, what I didn't write down. So that cancels right there.